Alright, Shabbat Shalom! Shabbat Shalom! Shalom. Well, anybody watching this on the internet is going to be wondering, why is he on the other side? Because the ship is tipping. Okay, fine. <laughs> Alright, let's try that again. Shabbat Shalom! Shabbat Shalom! Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> um, time of second exodus. Now, for a moment, look at this. What do you see? Anybody? Now it's your question. Christmas tree. What? Christmas tree. What? No, on the screen. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> really? What did she say? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> yeah, it's too much back. <laughs> no. I see the bird. Up there, Ange. What do you see? We're, we're trying to avoid that with the camera. <laughs> what do you see? When you see, when you're looking at what's up here on the screen, what, what? Not to sound like a broken record, what do you see? The return okay. of Yeshua. Okay. What else? Uh, it's kind of hard to see. Yeah. Is it? Okay. It is. It is kind of hard to see. It, it looks like. There's a whole lot of people heading to yeah. that mountain. Yeah. Oh, is that we, a mountain? Yeah. Oh, okay. We know that Yeshua. Scripture talks about that Yeshua will. The Yahweh, uh, Zechariah 14, um, um, what's the other one? Where he will claim, he will claim his mouth. Uh, Isaiah 2, 2 through 4, Micah 4, 1 through 5, where it says that he will proclaim his mountain above all the mountains, his holy mountain, where he will sit, where our, 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 our Messiah, our Savior, yeah. From back here, it looks like clouds. So oh, it, okay. it looked like well, Yeshua yeah. returning or something. I'm sorry. Right. Everybody's probably like, I don't see nothing. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. I heard you. <laughs> kind of spooky, huh? All right. Second, uh, time of Second Exodus. Now, I've heard a lot of different stories about what the Second Exodus is. I've heard a lot of congregations teach that um, it starts. It's already started. Or I've heard a lot of congregations teach. Um, that it won't happen till later, and then some say it won't happen until Yeshua returns, and stuff like that. And more often than not, and anybody disagrees with me, say so, that when you think of the second exodus, you think of just the Israelites who were cast out of Israel. You don't put your, a lot of people don't relate themselves to that second exodus. All right? But here's something that we need to understand as we get into the Word, and we're going to get a, hopefully, uh, a better understanding, y'all willing, of what exactly the second exodus is and how it pertains to us. Uh, go to the next slide. Uh, to uh, give recognition to um, <coughs> Yaakov Nate Lawrence, who wrote an article. Uh, he has two, two things here he said that I really like. The biblical prophets speak of a greater or second exodus to occur in the last days where Yah's people, Yahweh's people who've been scattered throughout the nations of the world will be set free from their spiritual, economic, and political enslavement in the nations, which are under the control of Babylon the Great. There is much to learn on this subject, and it's an important subject to study since it affects our spiritual destiny. Next slide. In these, huh? in these last days before Messiah's second coming, more and more redeemed believers in Yeshua are discovering a newfound love for the Jewish people and the land of Israel. At the same time, they are awakening to the need to return to the Hebrew roots of the Christian faith by adhering to a more Torah-centered lifestyle and spiritual walk. All right, go to the next slide for the scriptures. Now here, here's something before we get started, I want to point this out. One thing we need to understand is there was two times, two things of Yah booting Israel out of Israel. The first one is when Yah divorced Israel, the ten northern <coughs> tribes, and kicked them out, sent them, scattered them to the ends of the earth. The second time was in 70 AD when the majority of Judah and Benjamin were kicked out of Israel when they were scattered out except for a small number of people because Yah promised there would always be a remnant of Judah in Israel. 
But the majority of Judah, if they weren't killed, was scattered out throughout the land, throughout the world. Um, anybody who knows their history, Titus of Rome um, put, put a siege around Jerusalem for three and a half years. It had gotten so bad, which is scriptural, that they, uh, the soldiers, they had cut off all supply lines of, of any be, anybody being able to get in and around. So they couldn't get food, nothing. And the soldiers were walking through the streets and they could smell meat being cooked. Unfortunately, Israel was cooking their own young to eat and survive. It be, they became cannibalistic. These, all of this stuff was going on. And so when Israel, when the temple and everything was destroyed in 70 AD, the rest of Israel, Judah, was scattered among the nations. So remember all that. So, to, before I get to the main scripture of what this whole thing covers, because everything is about the, the second exodus, and where our place is in that, um, let's, let's establish um, one particular scripture that is a prophetic from the Torah of what Yah was going to do in the first place, because he already knew what was going to play out. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 through 10. Now it shall come to pass when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where Yahweh your El drives you. And, and you return to Yahweh your El and obey His voice. According to all that I command you today, you and your children with all your heart, with all your soul, that Yahweh your El will, will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you, and gather you again from all the nations where Yahweh your El has scattered you. If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts under heaven, from there Yahweh your Elohim will gather you, and from there He will bring you. Then Yahweh your Elohim will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. He will prosper you and multiply you more than, more than your fathers. And Yahweh your Elohim will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love Yahweh your El with all your heart, with all your soul that you may live. Also Yahweh your Elohim will put all these curses on your enemies and on those who hate you, who persecuted you. And you will again obey the voice of Yahweh and do all His commandments which I command you today. Yahweh your Elohim will make you abound in all the work of your hand, in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, and in the produce of your land for good. For Yahweh will again rejoice over you for good as He rejoiced over your fathers. If you obey the voice of Yahweh your Elohim to keep His commandments and His statutes which are written in this book of the Torah, and if you turn to Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart and with all your soul. Now what I want to do is we've established what Yah told us in the Torah was coming. What was going to happen with Israel. He says that as your fathers dwelled in the land, I will bring you back from where I scattered you from. Yah already knew, as we all know, if we understand the word, if we believe in the word of Yah from Genesis to Revelation, if we understand that, that Yah knew everything that was going to play out before he even started with the first thing, of Genesis 1-1. Because we serve an all-knowing, all-powerful God. Amen? Amen? And there is no other. Amen? Amen? So with that said, now let's go to the main subject of, of the main scripture. Ezekiel 37. question I have, and it could be rhetorical, or if somebody wants to answer, you're welcome to. How many here know what Ezekiel 37 is? The dry bones. Alright, let's read it first, then, we'll, then I'll present the question. The hand of Yahweh came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of Yah, and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. 
Then he caused me to pass by them all around. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed they were very, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O Gabriel, you know. Again he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of Yahweh. Thus says Yahweh to these bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with, with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am Yahweh. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and I, as I prophesied, there was a noise, and suddenly a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. And also he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says Yahweh, come from the four winds, remember this, I'm going to come back to this, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breathe, and breath, sorry, came into them, and they, and they lived, and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says Yahweh Elohim, and Behold, O oh my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Now, something I want you to remember real quick. How does Yah establish something? What is the first thing He does? First in the... Okay, I want you to remember that because we're going to be coming back to this. Then you shall know that I am Yahweh when I have opened your graves... O oh, my people, and brought you up from your graves. I will put my spirit in you. You shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, Yahweh, have spoken it and performed it, says Yahweh. Again, the word of Yahweh came to me, saying, As for you, son of man, take a stick for yourself and write on it. For Judah and for the children of Israel, or the house of Ephraim, his companions. Then take another stick and write on it. For Joseph the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. Then join them one to another for yourself into one stick, and they will become one in your hand. So we understand that Israel got split. Of the twelve tribes, the ten other tribes, Yah divorced uh, Israel and cast her out into the world because of her spiritual idolatry, going after other gods and, and everything else, and not being obedient to the commandments of Yah. Judah and Benjamin remain, and, and Judah being the house, the house of Jacob or Judah, and then Ephraim being the house of Joseph. Y'all sitting here saying that he is going to bring the two houses back together and make them one once again. Let's see, where was I? Verse 19. Say to them, Thus says Yahweh, Surely I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim and the tribes of Israel. His companions, I will join them with it, with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they will be one in my hand. And the sticks on which you write with, uh, or, I'm sorry, write, will be in your hand before their eyes. Then say to them, Thus says Yahweh Elohim, Surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations, wherever they have gone, and will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land and on the mountains of Israel, and, on one king sh and one king shall be king over them all. They shall no longer be two nations, nor shall they ever be divided into two kingdoms again. They shall not defile themselves anymore with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will deliver them from all their dwelling places in which they have sinned, and will cleanse them. Then they shall show; they shall be my people. I will be with their God. David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd. They shall all walk in my judgments, observe my statutes, and do them. Then they shall dwell in the land that I have given to Jacob, my servant, where your father dwelt, and they shall dwell there, they, their children, and their children's children forever, 
and my servant David shall be their prince forever. Is this talking literally about David? No. No. Who is it talking about? Yes, amen. Yeshua. Why? Why is it a reference of David? Because he's the seed of David. Yeah, what did you say, Anthony? Same thing, yeah, he's from the seed of David. Exactly, from the house of Judah. All right, let's see. Verse 26, Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. I will establish them, multiply them. I will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their Yah, and they shall be my people. The nations also will know that I, Yahweh, sanctify Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forever. Now, here's something I want to put into your ear for a minute. And not to get ahead of myself, I'm going to be kind of rabbiting a little bit on this because there's multiple things I want to bring together in the in the finish of this, in the conclusion of it, all right? Now, you have seen, you understand, if anybody doesn't understand, raise your hand and let me know. We understand the physical aspect of what's happened here. Yah created a people that, to call His own, right? They're His children, right? Does Yah have two different sets of kids? No, he only has one set of kids. If I have my blood child and I adopt a child, um, if I'm the, a good parent, am I going to go around telling everybody this is my blood kid and this is my adopted kid, or am I going to say these are my kids? Anybody? Okay, am I putting you all to sleep? <laughs> um, these are my kids. The same with Yah. Those who are adopted into the house of Israel. What does Torah say? He says, if you come in and you're willing to keep the commandments and keep his, uh, his, his word and everything else, you are what? Like the native born. Like the native born. Alright? So with that established, here's the spiritual aspect of what I want to get to. We know that Yah had a reason for Israel to be divorced, for Judah to be just, uh, cast out, for all of Israel basically, except for a, a few people, to be cast out of Israel and for Israel to lay dry and desolate for the next 2,000 years. Anybody want to take a shot at why that is? Karen? So the Gentiles come? Yes. Gentiles, what else? Spread the word. But here's the... There's an upside and a downside to this. The veil was put over Israel. So that Israel would not understand and receive the truth because, why? Because the Jews rejected Messiah. Right? So, here comes the church in the third century. And the church at first, and the believers at first, established and walked in all of the ways of Yah. The Gentiles were pouring into the body of Messiah by the tens of thousands. And where did that wall come up and knock everything out of loop? Anybody? Here's the spiritual aspect of what I'm going to, what I'm going to get into. Leading up to what? Ezekiel 37 is telling us both in the physical and in the spiritual. The church rose up and took the word of God and deleted two-thirds of it. Constantine set the stage because he thought himself to be a god and wanted to take Christianity, Messianic, or whatever you want to call it, the truth of Yah's word, the truth of the Bible, and took it, made it his own religion to follow him, and outlawed the keeping of Sabbath, outlawed the keeping of the commandments, and everything else that was the beginning of messing up what God had put into put into what into the way for every one of us to follow after. Then the next step was from Constantine came the Catholic Church. How many people know that every denomination of the church comes from the Catholic Church? Okay? If you don't know that, go study it out and research it for yourself. It will knock your socks off. Literally. Alright. Next thing here is we have the Catholic Church come in, and you, 
And like I always say, go take my word for it, go study this out for yourself, and go find out for yourself. But the Catholic Church, in their own catechism books, they have told us and showed us that they have <coughs> already changed the Word of God. That they got rid of the Sabbath uh, from Saturday and changed it to Sunday. They're the ones that declared that the, that the Old Testament and the commandments of God no longer apply. That they have been done away with and claimed that Jesus died on the cross and did away with it when it doesn't say that anywhere in the New Testament. Three, they even re rewrote the Ten Commandments. They got rid of the Second Commandment altogether and took number ten and split it in half. All of this, and then this religion filtered down into the churches to, to, through, for the next 1,800 years. And what's the point to everything I'm just saying? Here's the point, and I'm just feeding you the first bit of it. Physical Israel was divided. How many here understand, and those who are new visiting us today, how many here understand that if you have Yeshua in your heart, you are a part of the house of Israel? Amen. Do you understand what that means? Okay? We are Israel. Now, are we all of Israel? No. But we are Israel. Ephesians chapter 2, Paul tells us if you were formerly known as a Gentile, but you are now the commonwealth of Israel because you have received Yeshua. Uh, Galatians 3, 26 through 29 tells us you are neither Jew nor Gentile, you are neither male nor female, slave nor or free. Uh, if you are of Messiah, you are a chad, you are one, and you are uh, of it, uh, you are heir of the seed of Abraham, and you are of uh, the covenant, heir to the covenant. You are of the seed of Abraham, and you are heir to the covenant. Then Romans 11 says that you are grafted in for the natural branch that was that rejected Messiah rejected Yah's commandments and everything was cut off and the wild olive branch was, was grafted in. All of these things, it's like a skin graft, okay? Let's use that as an example. Anybody who's ever been burned or something, they have a skin graft? Is that skin graft no longer, is it not a part of them? Or is it a part of them? Okay? That, that is the simplest way to describe that when we receive Yeshua, we are grafted in and we are just as real of the part of the house of Israel as blood-born Israel. Amen. Amen. Alright? So, my point to this is what has happened since the Catholic Church? What has caused the what will be a part of the second exodus? It is not just Israel as a nation being restored as a nation and the people coming back into the land. The restoration, the second exodus of Israel is the body of Messiah coming back to the truth of God's Word. Amen. And that is what hit me the hardest last night. As I was putting this together, it just overwhelmingly just... Every time I thought I was about done to finish up putting the message together, it's like y'all kept giving me more scripture from the from the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, to to tie in together the physical of what happened with Israel. Israel got divorced, and the body of Messiah got divorced shortly after that because she turned and walked away from all of Yah's commandments, walked away from all of the things that are the heart of our Father. And he says, in the last days, I will bring you back in. I will bring you back around. And I will, and I will circumcise your heart. And you will serve me with all of your heart, all of your strength, and all of your soul. Alright. So the next thing I want to hit on. Let's look at, make sure I'm not mixing anything here. All right, let's look, let's look at Jeremiah 3, 6 through 18.
Jeremiah 3, 6 through 18. Yahweh said also to me in the days of Josiah the king, Have you seen what backsliding Israel has done? She has gone up on every high mountain and under every green tree. Come on. <laughs> hey, Jeremiah 10, 1 through 4 has got the Christmas tree all in it, and it is not a happy thing. Yahweh said also to me in the days of Josiah the king, Have you seen what backsliding Israel has done? She has gone up on every high mountain and under every green tree, and there played the harlot. Look, I'm going to tell you something right now. Even though we are talking about physical Israel back in the day, this pertains to the body of Messiah every bit. Because the Catholic Church, once again, everything points back to the Catholic Church and what Satan did when he planted her in the body of Messiah. All of the feasts, seven feasts. Can, I'm going to ask you guys, can anybody please explain to me why in the world would I set aside seven feasts that God created for us? He created these things. He gave these to me from His heart. Seven awesome, amazing feasts to keep every single year. Why would I give those up and adopt two pagan uh, holidays of Christmas and Easter that have nothing to do with my Messiah? For one, my Messiah was not born in December. My Messiah had nothing to do with Ishtar or any of the other stuff. Why would I want to keep this that the Catholic Church brought in that has been proven to go all the way back to the Babylonian pagan practices that is the start of all paganism in the world, historically proven and in every other way biblically proven? Why would I want to touch these things just because... Well, everybody else does it, or that's not the way I do it. That ain't going to fly when we stand before the Father. That excuse is not going to fly. Yah said, do not come unto me as the heathens do. Period. He said, keep my feast, my Moedim, my appointed times. He gave us these things. He, uh, he ordained these things. And the Scripture even proves that when Yeshua comes back and proclaims His kingdom as King of Kings for the millennial reign, it shows that we will keep the feast that Yahweh ordained from the beginning all through millennial reign. Amen. So somebody tell me how in the world that is done away with. But yet that is what happened. And that is what Yah is showing us here. He is showing us here. You, you have done the, crisp, the trees and all the other stuff that they have put into this. We have played the harlot. Because we have adopted the practices that have nothing to do with our Father that He did not give us to do and committed spiritual adultery. Are you hearing me? Amen? One amen? Amen. 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 It was nice enough to put up an illustration. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. Verse 7. And I said, after she had done all these things, return to me. Yahweh says, after she's done all this stuff, he's saying, return to me. But she did not return. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. Then I saw that for all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, I had put her away, gave her a certificate of divorce, yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but went and played the harlot also. I'm going to hit you with something else. I'm going to ask you flat out, and you don't have to raise your hand. If you don't raise your hand, it doesn't mean you don't agree with what I'm asking or anything like that. So I'm just letting you know you're off the hook on that. Are you serving Yah? His way, or do you want to serve Yah your way? I want to serve Yah his way. His way. Okay? I want to serve Yah my way. I'm sure glad I didn't get no hands up on that one. We'd have to have a different conversation. <laughs> so here's my question to you. If we want to serve Yah his way, then, then why are we not walking in obedience to His Word and all the things that He says to do. 
why are we looking for an excuse or a reason to kick something to the curb just because that's the way the church taught us growing up? We've all been there. We all came out of the church and, 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 and everything that it taught us that we're saved by grace and, and, and faith, and that's not a lie. We can't, have, we can't have salvation except that we are saved by grace through faith. But all through the New Testament, it also says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Amen. And it doesn't say you get to pick and choose which ones those are. It says, keep my commandments. End of discussion. Mm -hmm. So we keep the Sabbath day holy. We keep the Ten Commandments. We honor Yah, and we keep his Moedim, his feast. And besides, I think I'm robbed. I got robbed. I grew up keeping two pagan holidays that I, at the time, thought were for God. And I was missing out on seven amazing feasts. Now I got seven amazing feasts. I get blessed seven times a year in those feasts Amen. all year long. Amen. It's awesome. I get to experience the presence of God in a way I never, ever could before. But we won't get that if we don't stop playing the harlot. Verse 9, so it came to pass through her casual harlotry that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. And yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah had not turned to me with her whole heart, but in pretense. What does that mean, but in pretense? Is anybody, anybody got an answer on that? What does that mean? Those so saying that she turned to her... Pretending they, they, their heart wasn't really into it. They're just... Kind of like what Yeshua said. Yeah. They... they <clears throat> Yeah, amen. What, anybody not hear what Gary just said? I didn't. He, he, he quoted what Yeshua said. They, they bless me with their mouth, but their heart is far from me. That's what pretense is. Verse, uh, where did I go? Uh, 11. Then Yahweh said to me, backsliding Israel has shown herself more righteous than treacherous Judah. Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return, backsliding Israel, says Yahweh. I will not cause my anger to fall on you, for I am merciful, says Yahweh. I will not remain angry forever. Only acknowledge your iniquity that you have transgressed against Yahweh your help and have scattered your charms to alien deities under every what? Oh. And you have not obeyed my voice, says Yahweh. Return, O backsliding Israel. Hang on a second. What is the only requirement Yah said? What did he say? Teshuvah. Teshuvah, repent, return. He says, only acknowledge your iniquity. Only acknowledge your sin. How much do we rob ourselves because our pride stops us from going to the Father and just saying, I have screwed up. I have sinned to you. Like King David, when the prophet Nathan came to him and said, you are that evil, wicked man that took the man's only lamb and slaughtered it and stole it from him when he committed adultery with Bathsheba and sent her husband to the front line to die. The man carried his own death sentence. Didn't even know it. And when Nathan confronted him on it and said it, did, did King David make excuses? Did he allow his pride to well up or anything else? He hit that floor and he said, Father, I have sinned against you. And that is what stops us from Teshuvah, from returning to the Father when we have sinned. And he says, you need but only acknowledge your iniquity and I will bring you back. Fourteen, return of backsliding children, says Yahweh, for I am married to you. I will take you, one from a city and two from a family. I will bring you to Zion. I will give you shepherds according to my heart, who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. Then it shall come to pass when you are multiplied And increased in the land of those days is Yahweh that they will say no more. The ark of the covenant of Yahweh, it shall come to mind, nor shall they remember it, nor shall they visit it, nor shall it be made anymore. 
At that time Jerusalem shall be called the throne of Yahweh, and all the nations shall be gathered to it, to the name of Yahweh, to Jerusalem. No more shall they follow the dictates of their evil hearts. In those days the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel. They shall come together out of the land on the north and the land that I have given as an inheritance to your fathers. This is millennial reign right here. This is entering into millennial reign. All right, let's go to the next one. Let's go to, um, let's see, I want to make sure I keep everything in line with what I'm doing here. Let's go to Jeremiah 16. Jeremiah 16, 14 through 21. Yahweh, I'm sorry, therefore behold the days are coming, says Yahweh, that it shall no more be said. Yahweh lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt. But Yahweh lives who brought up the children from Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands where he had driven them. For I will bring them back into their land which I gave to their fathers. Behold, I will send for many fishermen says Yahweh, and they shall fish them, and afterward I will send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and every hill and out of the holes of the rocks. We're going to come back to that. Fishermen. Verse 17, For my eyes are on all their ways. They are not hidden from my face, nor is their iniquity hidden from my eyes. And first I will repay double for their iniquity and their sin, because they have defiled my land. They have filled my inheritance with the carcasses of their detestable and abominable idols. Here is a part that the Gentiles comes in. O Yahweh, my strength and my fortress, my refuge in the day of affliction. The Gentiles, listen, the Gentiles shall come to you, talking about Yahweh, from the ends of the earth and say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies. This is what I'm talking about. This is from every pastor behind the pulpit who has told you, you don't have to keep the commandments of God anymore because Yeshua nailed them to the cross. Bull! Why in the world would the Father come and die on the cross and nail His own commandments to the cross that He gave you so you can walk in obedience to Him? How in the world does that make sense? That's like a parent making the decision, you know what, my kids, my son, my daughter, or whatever I have, you don't no longer have to listen to me. You do not have to obey me anymore. I love you. You're under my grace. Go and live and do however way you want to do. That is exactly what is being taught to the body of Messiah. They are being told you don't have to live in obedience. You are saved by the free grace card, get out of jail free card. You're going to make it to heaven no matter what you do wrong. And that is not what the Word of Yah says. As a matter of fact, the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, teaches us that we are held even more accountable because of the death on the cross. So please explain that one to me. And show me why the Father would go through such a horrible, brutal death just so we can live free willy-nilly. Amen? Amen? And right here is that answer. The Gentiles shall come to you from the ends of the earth and say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies, worthlessness and unprofitable things. Will a man make gods for himself which are not gods? Therefore, behold, I will this once cause them to know, I will cause them to know my hand and my might, and they shall know that my name is Yahweh. Alright. So let's look. One last one before we start tying stuff together. Let's look at uh, Zechariah 2. This is all playing out. All of this to restore and bring back Israel for the second exodus. There is a piece of that second exodus that has started and that was the rebirth of Israel. And some of the house of Judah coming back, coming back to, to the house. And there may be a few stragglers here of the house of Ephraim who have gone into Israel. 
But hang on a second. Zechariah 2, 1 through 13. Then I raised my eyes and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. So I said, what, what, Where are you going? And he said to me, To measure Jerusalem, to see what is its width and what is its length. And there was the angel who talked with me going out, and another angel was coming out to meet him. Who <coughs> said to him, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls. Because of the multitude of men and livestock in it. For I say, for I, says Yahweh, will be a wall of fire all around her. And I will be the glory in her midst. Up, up, flee from the land of the north, says Yahweh. For I have spread you abroad like the four winds of heaven. We're going to come back to that, says, Ye um, says Yahweh. Up, Zion, escape, you who dwell with the daughter of Babylon. For thus says Yahweh Tzveo, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. A little off note. Stop being a victim to the enemy. Let me ask you something. I mean, let's let's just pause for a second. I want to, I, you know, I, I never want to skip an opportunity to, to do this. Because I don't think it's done enough to the children of Yahweh. I want you to take a second and think about, think about this omnipotent power of our Creator that we serve. This one that spoke, and Trinity, you breathe breath. This one that spoke, and Tom, you were made. That Angela's, God knew you both before the foundation of the earth. Brother, Yah knew what was going to happen to you over a year ago. He knew he was going to bring you right back here where you belong. We serve a powerful God. A God that divided the ocean so that three million plus could walk across dry land. Are you fathoming that? We serve a God who Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood in a pit of fire that was heated seven times hotter than even the very soldiers that cast them in burned up on the spot. Anybody here ever burn their hand or something? Okay, now you imagine being thrown to a furnace that is, God only knows how hot, that it would incinerated the very person that threw you in it. Are you getting me? We serve a mighty, mighty God. And now I want you to think about this. He says, you are the apple of my eye. You are every... Uh, you are everything to Him. You are the apple of His eye. Is there anything that can touch you? I got to hear a bigger answer than that. No. Is there anything that can touch you? No. no. Amen. Outside of His will. Oh yeah. Okay. But even Job, no matter what Yah allowed him to go through, what did Yah do for Job when it was all done? He restored everything back unto him double fold. We give the enemy too much authority in our life. Yah said, you're the apple of his eye. It's time to walk in that. Amen? Amen. All right. Verse 9, For surely I will shake my hand against them, and they shall become spoiled for their servants. This is what Yah is going to do to the people that come against you. Are you listening to me? To those who are Israel. Yah is going to shake his hand against them. And they're going to become the spoil to your servants. 
Are you, is it sinking in? Then you will know that Yahweh Tzveo has sent, you, sent me. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I am coming. I will dwell in your midst, says Yahweh. Many nations shall be joined to Yahweh in that day, and they shall become my people. I will dwell in your midst. Then you will know that Yahweh Tzveo, the Lord of hosts, has sent me to you. And Yahweh will take possession of Judah as his inheritance in the Holy Land, and will again choose Jerusalem. Be silent, all flesh, before Yahweh, for he is aroused from his holy habitation. Now here's where I want to start tying things in. Let's go to Matthew chapter 23. I want to show you when the second exodus is truly going to happen, and I want to show you who is a part of that second exodus. Matthew 23, 37 through 39. Here's the first key piece. Yeshua says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. This is that destruction Yeshua was proclaiming a prophetic of what was coming in 70 AD. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahweh. Now hold on a second. This is one of the things that hit me last night that I never caught before. I understood it, but I didn't understand it. What does Yeshua just say there at the end, Robert? What did he just say, that last part? You won't see me again. Until? You cry out. Blessed is he who comes in the name of God. Until you Jerusalem. cry Blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahweh. So in other words, until you recognize Yeshua. So... So Yeshua is not going to come back until Israel receives Yeshua. That second, that second Exodus. Hang on, I'm going to get ahead of myself. <laughs> All right, so now I want to take Matthew 24, 29 through 31, Mark 13, 27, and we're going to correlate these with Ezekiel, Isaiah, uh, Ezekiel and Isaiah. Yeah. Making sure I got it right. Alright, so let's look at Matthew 24 real quick. Everybody knows, anybody who studied prophecy at all knows that Matthew 24 is nothing about, is everything about end time prophecy. About what's going to happen in tribulation time, second coming, all that stuff. Alright? So let's look at these specific three verses. Yeshua again speaking says, Verse 29, 30, 31. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes. Thank you. Tribes of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He will send His angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together His elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now when you read that, what's the first people that you think of as the elect? Believers. Amen. Okay, no argument. Amen. But who is the elect that Yah talks about all through the, uh, the Tanakh, the Old Testament? Israel. Okay, you see where I'm going here for a second? So now let's relate this to Mark 13, 27. The one thing I've never heard anybody say is that the second exodus, and this is one of the points I'm trying to bring, I've never heard any pastor or anybody ever declare that the second exodus pertains to the believers. I've heard that the believers are part of Ephraim, 
but I've never heard anybody teach that the second exodus pertains greatly to the believers. And this is why, this is what hit me that I've never, that's never hit me like this before. And this is how I'm relating the scriptures. So let's look at Mark 13, 27. Just in case I was starting to be confusing as to where I was going with this. Mark 13, 27, Yeshua says, And then He will send His angels and gather together His elect from the four winds, from the farthest part of the earth to the farthest part of heaven. Here is where Scripture backs up, backs up Scripture. So now let's go to Ezekiel chapter 5. Ezekiel chapter 5. Quick question. Anybody who is of natural born Israel, if they have not received Yeshua, will they enter into the kingdom of heaven? Okay, just want to establish that real quick. Ezekiel 5, 10 through 12. Therefore fathers shall eat their sons in their midst, and sons shall eat their fathers, and I will execute judgments among you, and all of you who remain I will scatter to all the winds. Are you hearing me? This is the, what was being declared is going to happen to them. Therefore, as I live, says Yahweh El, surely because you have defiled my sanctuary with all your detestable things and with all your abominations, therefore I will also diminish you. My eye will not spare, nor will I have any pity. One third of you shall die in the uh, pestilence and be consumed with famine in your midst, and one third shall fall by the sword all around you. I will scatter another third to all the winds. I will draw out a sword after them. Now hang on. Now let's go to Ezekiel 17, 21. Seventeen twenty one. All his fugitives with all his troops shall those who remain shall be scattered to every wind. You shall know that I Yahweh have spoken. Yahweh is telling us multiple times, and I'm not done yet. And in, in the Tanakh, the prophetic of what was going to happen, he was scattering the, his people to the four to the winds. The very thing of what Yeshua was telling us in Matthew 24 and Mark 13 that I will go and gather my elect from the four winds of heaven. From the four corners of the earth, we are seeing the pro prophecy of bringing back what was being prophesied was going to happen at the scattering. Does that make sense? Okay. Say that five times real fast. All right, let's go to Isaiah. Isaiah 11, verse 12. Now here is a part of that restoration. Now, I encourage you, study all of 11. You need to read all of 11. Verse 11, It shall come to pass in that day that Yahweh shall set his hand against the second coming. Again, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, let me reread that. It shall come, come to pass in that day that Yahweh shall set his hand again the second time to recover the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left. From Assyria and Egypt, from Pathros and Cush, from Elam and Shinar, from Hamath and the islands of the sea. And let's read verse 12. He will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Are you hearing me? All of chapter 11 is a reference to entering into millennial reign, by the way. Now let's go to the next one. Also, Isaiah chapter 27. Isaiah chapter 27, verses 12 and 13. And it shall come to pass in that day that Yahweh will thresh from the channel of the river to the brook of Egypt, you will be gathered one by one, O oh, you children of Israel. What does it say in that other verse? I will gather one from here and two from a family. 
Verse 13, so it shall be in that day the great trumpet will be blown. They will come who are about to perish in the land of Assyria. They who are outcast in the land of Egypt and shall worship Yahweh in the holy mount of Jerusalem. What in the world does that paint a picture of? Anybody. What are we just given a picture here? The trumpet will blow. He will be. We will worship Yahweh in the holy mount of Jerusalem. They will come who are about to perish. We're talking about the very small remnant of the believers who have survived everything to the end, have not been beheaded or whatever. We are talking about Israel. We are talking about the believers. We are talking about the children of Yah who have the testimony of Yeshua and keep His commandments. He will gather them from the four corners of the earth, from the winds of, from the four winds of the heavens. Just like he says in Matthew 24 and in Mark 13. Because let me ask you something. Is Yah going to gather those who reject him? Have you ever seen Yah gather anybody who rejects him? What is it that Yah has always done when He gathers, when He saves? It has been those who have said yes to walking in His ways. The only one time is when Yah delivered Israel out of Egypt. And we know why that is. Because of the covenant that He gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because of His promise. Now I'm not taking away from natural Israel coming to Yah. But we need to understand and have an understanding that Yah is not gathering anybody who continues to reject Him and say no. His Word says that those who continue to sin, I will release them to a hardened heart and a reprobate mind. That's right. Those who will not receive Me, I reject you. He said, He even said it in Hosea 6.4, it says that my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge, so I will reject your children because you were to be priests unto me and deny me and, and play the harlot and all this stuff. I will reject your children. The second exodus that's coming, it is not just the restoration of Israel to the land. It is us. We are the key part of that second exodus. Amen? Amen. Amen. I don't have my contact in, so I can't tell if anybody's liking what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I'll get plenty of emails. Though. Um, again, that's entering into millennial reign. So let's look at the next one. Um, all right. Oh, okay, now let's look at Isaiah 43, 5 and 6. Isaiah 43, 5 and 6. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east, gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not keep them. Do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Now let's go even further. Verse 7, everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him, yes, I have made him. And what did we just read again in Matthew 24 and Mark, and Mark chapter 13? I will gather the elect from the four corners of the earth, from the, the four winds of the heaven, and all, however many different translations there are. And again, we have the exact same thing right here. He says, from the north, from the south, from the east, from the west, bring my daughters from afar, bring my sons from the ends of the earth. Those, everyone who is called by my name. Can you be called by his name if you reject who he is? No way. Can you be called by Him if you live in sin continuously and break His commandments and do the very things that He said that will separate you from Him? Are you called by His name? No. Alright. 
right, last couple things, last couple verses. Why, so why, of the body of Messiah falling into harlotry as Israel did because of this? Luke 21, 20 through 24. Luke 21, 20 through 24. Listen carefully, Yeshua speaks again, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart. Let not those who are in the, the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant, to those who are nursing babies in those days, for there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. Zechariah 14, verses 1 and 2 says that, that the armies will come in and, and take half of Jerusalem into captivity. The women will be ravished and the children will be dashed upon the rocks. And verse 24, And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. Which follows in with Revelation 11. Revelation 11, verse 1 and 2, Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise, measure the temple of Yah, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple. Do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles. And they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months, three and a half years. Hopefully that this gives you a better understanding that the second exodus that we are awaiting is not Israel or the Jews who are out there and continue to reject Messiah. Because as long as they do, Romans 11 describes it very clearly, those branches are cut off. Though the second exodus that we are awaiting is the exodus of the believers of when Yeshua returns and we will be gathered together into Him, we will rule and reign with Yeshua, and those who are of Israel, of Judah, the remnant that will be allowed to continue on, will continue on in the flesh. But they will have to continue in the way that Isaiah chapter 40 through 48 declare. And that's a whole other message. The second exodus is us coming, going home when our Messiah comes back. The second exodus that we await is the return of Yeshua so that we can go home to the promised land. Amen? Amen. Amen.